Hi everybody, this is an intro to the Quantopian lecture series. So if you're already familiar with Quantopian and with the lecture series, please feel free to skip ahead. Quantopian is a crowdsourced investment firm. And our goal is to democratize quantitative finance and to level Wall Street's playing field by providing a lot of free tools and data of the same caliber that you would run into as a professional on Wall Street. Our business model is to provide capital allocations to the best algorithms that are developed on the platform. To this end, we've developed a pretty extensive educational curriculum to make sure that our users are well educated. The Quantopian lectures are developed in conjunction with and are used for teaching by professors at top universities all around the world. We also work with industry practitioners to make sure that all the examples that we teach are current and up to date with techniques that are actually being practiced in the field today. In general, we try to teach theory and intuition hand in hand so that once you've learned a concept, you have readily accessible code snippets to then go out and apply it. Let's get right into it then and see what we're getting into today. Today we're going to talk about position concentration risk, which is the risk associated with investing your portfolio in just a few assets. This is a problem that is often discussed both in and outside of finance, so it's a, a very critical thing. It's, a, it's very common knowledge that diversifying your portfolio leads to overall lower risk, but how does this calculation actually pan out, right? If we actually do the math, we find that by incorporating more uncorrelated assets into a portfolio, we can increase the overall return of that portfolio while reducing the overall risk. So there's a clear incentive here, right? If we can lower the volatility of our overall portfolio, if we can lower the risk associated with investing in these assets, then our return is going to be more reliable. With a lower volatility, we'll be able to more consistently get a decent amount of return. Of course, by lowering the volatility of our overall portfolio, we are going to slightly reduce the return, but we're going to be getting a better return per unit of risk, the more uncorrelated assets that we add in to our portfolio. So let's quantify this with a simple blackjack example. We'll import some initial Python libraries here, and let's say that we have the ability to count cards so that we have a 1% edge whenever we're playing blackjack. So if ever we sit down to a blackjack table, we have a 51% chance to win. Let's say that we have $10,000. Now it would be very foolish to bet all $10,000 on one single blackjack table. What we want is to place this money at as many different individual tables as we can, because that way we can get as close as possible to earning that 1% edge. The expected outcome is that we're going to win the game, but we have so much variance associated with it that it may not happen on any one table if we're only betting once. So let's say that we have a thousand different universes. We're going to sample a thousand universes and bet at one table each time with a 51% chance to win. So this is binomial, so the output is going to be either 0 or 1. So if we run this, and then we take the mean of these results, we see that we're expected to win about half a game. And then we have a pretty large standard deviation in comparison with that, right? We've played so few games that we don't have any real opportunity for our edge to actually work. The more times that we actually bet, the more instances we're going to see where we get the chance to win. So let's instead play 100 games in each individual universe. And let's take the mean here. So we see that we're expected to win about 50.8. So that's much closer to 51 games, right? We're, we're edging ever closer to earning this 1% advantage. And by placing more independent bets, we've already reduced our variance significantly in relation to our expected games to win, right? Like these are of the same mag magnitude here, the mean and the standard de deviation, but here they're a magnitude apart. We're already doing better. If we then change it so that we're placing bets at 10,000 different blackjack tables, of course, this, it's going to be very unlikely to actually find a casino that has 10,000 different blackjack tables, but theoretically, right? So let's sample again 1,000 universes, but in each of these, we're placing 10,000 independent bets. Now, this is much, much closer, right? We've got 101 games as an edge over the house. So on average, we're going to make significantly more money. And then again, 
per individual universe, we're getting a much smaller standard deviation. We're already doing better. We're two magnitudes apart. Everything's fine and dandy. Our Sharpe ratio has already increased if we consider this as a portfolio construction problem. Of course, taking the mean and standard deviation of this uh, may be a bit of an abuse just because we're not sampling from a normal distribution directly, but they get the point across. So let's expand this idea to portfolio theory. Let's, instead of talking about bets at individual blackjack tables, let's incorporate the returns and prices of a stock. So let's invest in just one asset. We'll simulate an asset by sampling some returns from a normal distribution, mean return of 1%, standard deviation of 0.03, and we'll get 100 samples of returns. So we'll just have 100 different time periods for this asset. And we'll say that our asset is the cumulative product of these multiple different returns, and we'll plot these over time. So this is our asset here. So all that we have is just this. We're exposed entirely to the profit associated with this price, the movements of this price, as well as the volatility associated with this price. So let's instead look at a case where we place lots of individual bets, but the bets are correlated. So all of our assets are related to each other. So what we do here is we're going to sample 10 assets. The first is going to be uh, similar to this original asset up above. And then we're going to build a bunch of other assets based on that that are just fundamentally connected to it. They're equal to the return of the original asset plus some random noise factor associated with it. So we'll get these returns, we'll turn them into assets, and let's plot everything together as well as construct a portfolio associated with them. And what we're going to do for the portfolio is we're just going to say that we have one of each individual asset. So we'll look at the mean return of the portfolio and the standard deviation of the portfolio, as well as the volatility and, and mean returns of the individual assets. So if we sample all that, we see that the volatilities of the individual assets are all pretty comparable. The mean volatility is basically the same as the portfolio volatility overall. Like we're getting some benefit here. This is slightly less when we combine them all into a portfolio. But because all their volatilities are so close and they're all interrelated, we're not getting too much of a, of a benefit from grouping these together into a portfolio. So here we have the actual price of our portfolio. So this is, a, uh, we can extrapolate from this the returns of our portfolio versus the, the prices of all the individual assets that compose it in this much lighter tone on the same graph. Because all the assets in this portfolio are very closely linked to each other, they're all going to be affected by the same exact shocks. Like That's why we want to have uncorrelated assets. Just because if negative things affect one stock and it's highly correlated with everything else in our portfolio, then our whole por portfolio is going to be hit by that same exact shock. And the whole goal of incorporating multiple assets into a portfolio is to avoid shocks, to avoid risks like that in the first place. The mean volatility of our assets is essentially the same as our portfolio volatility. We haven't gained anything additional from making correlated bets. These correlated bets are essentially the same thing as the original bet. We're just going significantly harder on the initial asset that we already had. We're just getting as much of that as we can. That's essentially what's happening when we're making these correlated bets. So let's see what happens when we invest in many uncorrelated assets instead. We're going to make independent bets, similar to how we made independent bets at the blackjack tables. If we invest in many uncorrelated assets, we should ideally, theoretically, have an advantage. So what we're going to do is we're going to generate 10 unique securities that are in no way related to each other. They're all going to be based on their own sets of samples from the normal distribution. Again, this is multiplicative returns. We'll get the asset price by c calculating cumulative product, and we'll plot all these together. And then we'll assume that our portfolio is made of one of each of these, take the mean return, take the volatility, and compare everything. So if we actually run this, then we have all our individual asset volatilities, and they're kind of all over the place, right? Our mean asset volatility is about 0.03, as we might expect, because, well, that's what we made it by construction. But our portfolio volatility, because everything is unrelated in the first place, these are all independent from each other, our portfolio volatility is significantly less than our mean asset volatility. And that's awesome. Like, we're still getting a pretty decent return. We're still getting a pretty decent increase in the price here. But we're less exposed to the shocks that everything else is exposed to. So this is a clear advantage, right? 
making these uncorrelated bets lowers our volatility while still giving us a, a pretty decent return. This is the benefit of diversification that I've been talking about. Let's double check this assertion that the more independent bets we make, the better, right? So let's just construct these different portfolio volatilities here. And let's just increase the size of our portfolio and map how the portfolio volatility changes as a function of the number of independent assets that are a part of it. So that's what we're doing here. We're generating an independent assets and we're solely taking the standard deviation of everything up until then for each asset size. So if we plot this, then we see that as we increase the number of assets that we're adding in, the number of uncorrelated assets, our volatility is dropping. Of course, the, the marginal decrease in volatility is decreasing as we add more assets, but we're still getting a benefit with every additional uncorrelated asset that we add. And that's a big deal. That's important. This is a clear demonstration of the importance of incorporating multiple independent bets into one portfolio. We want to be as invested in as many different uncorrelated assets as possible. In finance, this is diversification. If you have a pricing model, price everything, invest accordingly, and go from there. Of course, in order to invest in a very large number of, number of assets, we're going to have some pretty severe capital constraints. So even if we're not able to invest in hundreds or thousands, even if we're not able to place 10,000 bets in blackjack, we still want to invest in hundreds. We still want to invest in 20. Like, even 20 uncorrelated assets in a portfolio give us an advantage in volatility versus 20 correlated assets, right? So this is the general, fairly easy construction, right? We're just taking means, we're just taking volatility. So let's just break this down a little bit more. Look at how the volatility and mean returns work out by looking at the array computations that go into calculating these values for a portfolio. A key assumption in modern portfolio theory, as I've been stressing before, is that if you combine multiple assets into a portfolio, you can reduce the entire package's overall risk. So what we do is we say that we have two assets, S1 and S2, and the weights in our portfolio are going to be omega-1 and omega-2, and these weights are just going to add up to 1. The portfolio is P, and these assets, S1 and S2, each have their own mean and standard deviation. In this case, then, the portfolio value is going to be omega times S1 plus omega 2 times S2, right? Like that's the overall price. If we have this fraction of S1 and this fraction of S2, the sum of those is going to be our portfolio. And that makes sense. So mu P is going to be the return of our portfolio P. With expected values, it's fairly simple to actually calculate what mu P is going to be, right? Like the, the expected value of mu P is going to be the expected value of mu 1 times omega 1 plus omega 2 times mu 2. And we can pull these constant weights out of the expectations, and that's going to give us omega times expected value of mu1 plus omega2 times expected value of mu2. And this is going to allow us to directly compute the expected return of the overall portfolio using the expected returns of the assets that are in the portfolio and their associated weights. We can then use these same exact characteristics in order to determine the overall risk of the portfolio. It's just going to be slightly more annoying. We need to incorporate the covariance between these two assets in order to properly calculate the overall variance. It's not as simple as just simply adding weight times variance and weight times variance. So we're just going to do the math out here. So if sigma squared p is the variance of the portfolio, then well, sigma squared p is equal to the variance of omega 1 times s1 plus omega 2 times s2. We'll separate this into the variance of one of them plus the variance of the other one plus this covariance here. And this is a theoretical result that you can find on Wikipedia if you need something that's more expanded out. In order to pull these constants out, we have to square them. Um, we square them here again, and we get omega 1, omega 2 times the covariance here. So our overall variance of our portfolio is going to be omega 1 squared, sigma 1 squared, plus omega 2 squared, sigma 2 squared, plus rho 1, 2 times omega 1 times omega 2 times sigma 1 times sigma 2. So what this row 1, 2 is, is this is the correlation between our two assets, S1 and S2. And this 1, 2 notation is just to denote that it's between assets 1 and 2. Now, if we want to actually calculate this out using array computations, well, let's say that our stocks are valued at 175. Our mean returns are 4 and 6 for each of them. I'm going to use R instead of row because I don't have a row character. Or it's going to be more annoying to use it. 
So R12, rho 12 is equal to 0.2. So the correlation between these two assets is 0 0.20. As such, the covariance, as per this calculation here, is going to be rho 12 times 0 0.05 and 0 0.08, assuming that these are the individual standard deviations of sigma 1 and sigma 2. Then the covariance matrix between S1 and S2 is going to be this two by two matrix here. So this is the first diagonal and this is the second diagonal. This is the variance of S1. This is the variance of S2. And on the off diagonal, this is going to be the covariance between them. And let's say that the weights for each of these stocks is 0 0.7 and 0 0.3. Then if we dot these together, we get the weights times the stock values, that's gonna be the portfolio value here. So if we want to look at the variance of the overall portfolio, what we do is we take the weights and the covariance matrix and we multiply the covariance matrix on either side by the weights. So we have the weights array, omega, times the covariance matrix, times the transpose of the weights array on the right as well. So then we take the square root of this variance and that's going to be our sigma p. That's gonna be our volatility. So the overall volatility of this portfolio is going to be 0.046, while the individual standard deviations of sigma 1 and sigma 2, uh, of S1 and S2, were 0 0.05 and 0 0.08. So we're already getting a lower volatility by incorporating these two assets into a portfolio together, even though they're only slightly correlated together here. The actual value of P is 92.5, if we want to look at the mean return of this new diverse portfolio, then all we have to do is just take the dot product between these weights and the returns up above. So that's going to be uh, np dot, dot of weights and mean returns dot transpose here. So we see that our return in this case is going to be around 4.6% with a lower volatility than either of the individual stocks. So we're getting less return than we would if we had invested everything in stock two, but we're getting significantly less volatility than if we had invested everything in stock two. So again, our return per unit of risk is going to be higher. So let's say that we extend this idea to incorporate n individual securities instead of just two, right? Then the variance of this portfolio extends in this way with these Riemann sums here. Let's say, well, let's take a specific case, right, where we have four stocks. Then we'll say that these are the prices of the individual stocks, these are ret the returns of those individual stocks, the standard deviations of those individual stocks, and the weights of those stocks in our portfolio. Then these R's here are going to be the different correlations between each stock and each other stock in our portfolio. So since we have four, it's all the different combinations that you can make between four different securities. And we see that we're gonna correlate some more than others, just to get a little bit of interesting flavor. And we'll define the covariance matrix here. Uh, and again, this is the variance of each of these on the diagonal. That's these squared parts here. And these are just the standard deviation squared as defined way back at the beginning. So if we construct our portfolio out of this set of assets, we're gonna say that our variance is, again, the weights times the covariance matrix times the weights transpose. And we're gonna take the volatility as the square root of the variance. The volatility of this overall portfolio is gonna be 0 0.05, which is again, almost better than any single individual stock that we've uh, incorporated into the portfolio. So we're getting slightly more volatility than the least volatile stocks in the portfolio, but much less volatility than the most volatile stocks in the portfolio. So instead of looking at all these like variously correlated assets, let's see what happens if these are all entirely uncorrelated. So we'll take this covariance matrix and we're gonna zero out everything else, everything that isn't on the diagonal. So we only have the variances and everything is totally unrelated to each other then our overall volatility is significantly less than any individual stock in the portfolio. This portfolio of uncorrelated assets is definitely better. Like the, the weights are the same, the returns for each of those weights are gonna be the same, so the portfolio value is the same, but the volatility is less. So again, we're getting a better return per unit of volatility. 
So I've included some code down below to allow you to generate some just mostly random portfolios. And this is this generate portfolio function here. So the default is going to be five assets, and we'll randomly generate five different asset prices, or n different asset prices, n different weights from the uniform distribution, normalize the weights. We'll pull out different returns for each of those individual assets, and then we'll calculate a covariance matrix that relates everything together. The way that this is defined, we fundamentally relate the variances, so these diagonals here in the covariance matrix, to the returns. So the variances are just going to be the returns scaled down by 100. And that's so that we have high variance proportional to higher return. Just because, well, this is a, a foundational assumption in modern portfolio theory. If we have a very high volatility asset, in order for people to actually want to invest in that, then it's going to need to come with an appropriate return. If you can get the same low return for a lower volatility, then that means you're going to be able to pull out that return more consistently with a lower volatility. So you might as well just invest in that asset instead of the higher volatility asset with the same return. It just doesn't really make in any sense as an investor. So feel free to modify this as long as you keep that assumption there. Or, or try to break that assumption and see how everything behaves or misbehaves after the fact. So let's generate a portfolio of six different assets just to demonstrate that. We'll run the function. Uh, here's our W. This is omega, the weights. This is the different assets associated with it. This is the mean return. This is the variance. This is the covariance matrix here. So these are the weights, assets, and we'll print everything out. Boom. So these are the weights. These are the assets associated with those weights in our portfolio. These are the returns for each of these individual assets, the variances for each of those, and the covariance matrix. And we can see here that the variances, again, are just the returns scale down by 100. So if we calculate the uh, portfolio value, it's just going to be P here. We'll calculate the variance of the portfolio and the volatility of the portfolio. Here's the value. Here's the volatility. Boom. So we see that we're getting a relatively low volatility for a relatively decent portfolio value overall. And this is pretty solid. This is emblematic of what we actually want whenever we're constructing a portfolio. So Again, feel free to modify that function in any way that you like. If you have any questions about this material, any other questions about for portfolio diversification, please feel free to email me. Max at Quantopian.com is my email. Feedback's great. Hi, everybody. Thank you for watching the Quantopian lecture series. If you have a desire to see any more of our content, it is all available at www.quantopian.com lectures. If you're already on the Quantopian site, you can also get to this page by going over to Learn and Support, clicking on Learn, and then this lectures link will bring you right back here. All of these lectures have a notebook associated with them, which contains the theory and applications for the lecture. It's the real meat. Many of these lectures will also have a video associated with them that you can watch, just like the one that you just watched. And then some of these lectures are going to have algorithms that you can clone and iterate on just to give you a basis to start with your own algorithmic trading ideas. We also have a GitHub which is at github.com slash quantopian slash research underscore public. All the stuff that's on our lectures page is also here if you dig around. You can also follow me on Twitter at clean underscore utensils. And we also have, last but not least, uh, some resources available for any sort of academics who want to incorporate the lecture series into their classes. All of this stuff is free. We just like to provide a little bit more guidance for professors who want to get Quantopian involved with how they teach. Lastly, you can email me at max at quantopian.com, and that's just M-A-X at quantopian.com. Feel free to send me any sort of feedback, any sort of questions you have about the lecture series. We're always looking to improve things, so we always want to hear comments about how we can make it better. Thank you so much.